Um, good evening, everyone. Thank you all so much for joining us tonight and bearing with me um, during my, my technical difficulties. My name is Elizabeth Sherman. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and I am an assistant curator at the Whitney Museum. This event is being live captioned. If you'd like to enable the captioning feature, please click on the transcript option in the bar below. And thank you so much to Morgan from Sign Nexus for the live captioning. I want to acknowledge that I am speaking to you tonight from the ancestral lands of the Canarsie and Muncie Lenape, otherwise known today as Brooklyn. I encourage everyone to take a moment to recognize the indigenous peoples with ancestral ties to the land where you are joining us from. I am thrilled to introduce our program this evening, Narrative Materiality, Dawood Bay and Turquoise Dyson in Conversation, which is organized in conjunction with Dawood's exhibition, The Whitney, Dawood Bay and American Project, on view through October 3rd. The exhibition spans over 40 years of Dawood's career, including his two most recent series, The Birmingham Project and Night Coming Tenderly Black. In her essay for the catalog that accompanies the exhibition, Dyson asks of their shared concerns. How do we invent new aesthetic forms that are imbued with radical ancestorship and that address our insistence on liberated spatial practice? Dyson and Bay will speak to these ideas and their ongoing dialogue about materiality and narrative. On that note, it is truly an honor to introduce our two panelists this evening. Turquoise Dyson describes herself as a painter working across multiple mediums to explore the continuity between ecology, infrastructure, and architecture. Examining environmental racism, as well as the history and future of Black spatial liberation strategies, Dyson's abstract works grapple with the ways in which space is perceived and negotiated, particularly by Black and Brown bodies. In 2019, Dyson's solo exhibition, I Can Drink the Distance was on view at the Cooper Union, New York, and her work was also presented at the Sharjah Biennial. I also had the distinct pleasure of working with Turquoise for a group show that I co-curated in 2018 here at the Whitney with my colleague Margaret Cross, Between the Waters, which included artists responding to the precarious state of the environment through a personal lens. As for Dawood, since the mid 1970s, Dawood Bay has worked to expand upon what photography can and should be, insisting that it is an ethical practice requiring collaboration with his subjects. He creates poignant meditations on visibility, power, and race. Dawood chronicles communities and histories that have been largely underrepresented or even unseen, and his work lends renewed urgency to an enduring conversation about what it means to represent America with a camera. Tonight's program will begin by sh with short presentations by Turquoise and Dawood, followed by a conversation between the three of us. Should we have time at the end of the program, we'll have a short Q&A, and I encourage you to send us your questions using the Q&A feature in Zoom. You can click on the icon at the bottom of your screen and then type your question. Please feel free to submit questions during the talk. We expect tonight's program to last until about 7 p.m. Thank you all again for tuning into the program. And I'd also like to express my deepest gratitude to Dawood and Turquoise. It is such a rare pleasure for me to be in dialogue with two artists whom I've separately worked with, but who are great friends themselves and ongoing interlocutors for each other. We are all lucky to get a peek into your sustained dialogue tonight. Now I'll turn things over to Turquoise. Thank you, Elizabeth, so much. Um, and thank you, Dawu, for inviting me into uh, the conversation. Um, I was prompted by Dawu to really talk about what it means to think about histories and translate those histories into um, the sort of the work I do with abstraction. And so I pulled from my projects to uh, exhibitions, uh, Blackwater, 1919 Blackwater and Nautical Dust. And what they have in common is this idea of looking at water infrastructure and architecture 
as spaces for liberation and also spaces of contested geography. So Dayud and I have, have, have talked a very long time about what it means to create liberation with the body and knowing that it's a, it's a um, condition of instinct and fortitude and an absolute belief and knowing that one can tackle the unknown with technique and um, a kind of infrastructure known um, as the body. So I'll talk about these two exhibitions first. Um, so this is 1919 Blackwater that was put on at Columbia University. And what I was thinking about was a story of a man by the name of Eugene Williams, who died, was murdered in Chicago in Lake Michigan. Um, beyond this sort of violent crime of race, he was killed by a white onlooker this, um, um, the summer, let me see, I'm sorry, uh, the summer July, 1919. And what, what astonished me about this story is that Eugene and his friends were able to, on the south side of Chicago in these segregated waters, create from debris, from infrastructure around the south side, a raft. And they would use this raft on um, Lake Michigan um, as a space that they played, they talked, they laughed. There was never a image of this raft. So I had to think about what does it mean for young boys in Chicago with material, found material to create this space of refuge. So using my own imagination to think about their ingenuity I really wanted to create a series of works, next slide please, next slide please, that talked about what it meant to understand details of material, space, water, to create an architectural structure within the place of liquid. And by creating this space, creating also at the same time, a space of liberation that they could hold on to as long as they were holding on to this raft. At the same time, this water uh, was also polluted um, by industrial runoff. So in the water, the boys would experience sometimes cold, sometimes hot water. And in this sort of um, modulation of material and space, they also continued to understand that, that their liberation in these moments were in their hands. And at that moment, I consider them very much architects that create art, that created architecture from you know, racialized infrastructure. Uh, next slide, please. So the paintings were very much built around ideas of accumulation and space, around ideas of the horizon and movement, and also around this idea of indeterminacy. That every time that they went out, and they what they did was they they built the raft, they tied it up, they built it, they tied it up. And when they'd use it, they'd untie it and put it in the water. So this kind of back and forth, you know, really was inspiring to me. The idea that you could create um, an engineer, an object that knew that it had to absorb this water and knew that it had to fluctuate with the heat of the water and make that object last and built it in a condition um, that when the pieces broke, you could replace those pieces from other found materials. So the idea of modulation and nomadicity and movement and structure and liquidity and expansion and contraction of materials were very much built into uh, the exhibition. Uh, next slide, please. So with this um, built environment, this idea of the horizon, materiality and movement, I was really interested in the ways in which people kind of hold on to liberation with these quotidian objects. And also in this huge, vast condition of spatiality, both, both defined by racism, but also defined by history of Chicago, which was, is hyper segregated. But also knowing that as these beaches were divided and these sort of false borders created, um, especially on the water as a, space that, as a space that I'm particularly interested in, how can these dividing lines be blurred, right? How can these dividing lines be blurred by onlooker and then that onlooker assume that these boys were in the wrong place at the wrong time? And these invisible, and these invisible borders, um, you know, as these brutal and contested geographies where life and death is um, determined um, by a racist condition. 
So what was happening in the exhibition is that what does it mean to understand what you see and what, it, what does it mean to completely um, misunderstand what you see and right and have a kind of architecture a language that provides a visibility at one point but also a, provides a measure of invisibility at another so ideas of opacity and transparency really came up in the work and also this idea of through ways right what does it mean to move through a city what does it mean to move through buildings to get to the water this is a water that is very much like michigan on the east side of chicago and what does it mean to trans form, um, you know, the materials of, this, of the city into uh, architectures of liberations. Next slide, please. So this exhibition was very much about the material and the state change. And I really do uh, believe in conditions of constant state change, right? State change, only state change as a kind of condition of making in my work. Um, but collectively, the works um, really spoke to what does it mean for the body to move through both rigid and liquid space? And what does it mean to hold on to spatial liberation strategies as long as you can and to hold liberation, um, the kind that you have to make and remake and, re and make and remake because of these waters, because whether it's the ocean, river, pond, meadows, but to move through them um, with the condition of instinct um, and look for play and look for joy and look for some autonomy. Next slide, please. So within the exhibition, I was very interested in the viewers moving through space both visually with their eyes, but also visually with their bodies and really playing with this horizon line and thinking about the horizon as a, um, as a condition or a space of imagination. Um, next slide, please. Next slide, please. So with um, um, 1919 Black Water, I paired it uh, with Nautical Dusk which is an exhibition I made at the Kobe Museum. And what they have in common is mainly this idea of the horizon, but also what does it mean to survive or last water? So um, as Eugene Williams and his dear friends made this raft to create a space in contested geographies that is water, what does it mean to be a kidnapped African from, from the continent and survive, no, not survive, but last the middle passage. So what this exhibition did was look at a man by the name of Samuel Osborne. And Samuel Osborne was born in Virginia, but he was born to a man who lasted the middle passage. And where he was kidnapped, we don't know. Where he was enslaved, we don't know. So, but I was thinking about this idea of his father lasting um, this kidnapping, this torture, this contested geography of the Middle Passage and Ocean. And then Samuel Osborne coming to Virginia, being born in Virginia, and then migrating um, to Maine where Kobe is. And um, Samuel worked at uh, Kobe College um, as a janitor for like 63 years. And what I was interested in is not only the condition um, of Samuel working in this space as a laborer for all these years and negotiating um, their students, professor, professors, what does it mean to be in a sort of didactic system and connect with students who are in and out, which he spoke about in and out of the institutions, creating these relationships, but also creating relationships outside of Colby College, right? So what this challenge was uh, around this exhibition um, for me was to think about an archive that told uh, Samuel's really diverse story. And when reading the archive, trying to figure out more about uh, this man who had devoted his life to this institution, who was born of uh, a father who had lasted the Middle Passage, what does it mean to be of water? What does it mean to be born of the Middle Passage? What does it mean to be of Blackness, right? And what does it mean to think about belonging? So I was thinking about nautical dust in the way to think about twilight and they're very different, you know, there are four different kinds of twilight, but nautical dust is a condition of twilight where the sun is 12 degrees just below uh, the horizon. 
So it's thinking about what does it mean to understand and be on these contested geographies like the uh, Atlantic Ocean from the Middle Passage onto Virginia, onto uh, migrating to um, Maine and thinking about a kind of lasting and moving through these spaces determined um, for your own kind of liberation. And these liberations, I think, in this sort of labor work as a janitor, definitely come from both quotidian spaces and these larger phenomenological spaces. So again, I had to imagine, um, to some extent, the connection between um, the father and the son in this archive, which is also incomplete. Next slide, please. So what I was interested in and carried through is this, again, idea of a, so a horizon, but also how does light scatter space? And using the idea of the sunlight and the scattering of space and in the exhibition by using reflective surfaces in relationship to the canvas to create different conditions of horizon lines. As the viewer moves through the space, the, can the canvas is reflected on the surfaces of the sculptures. And what was happening is I was creating a condition of the round where time, you know, this idea of the temporal, this idea of the spatial was also in a condition of state change. Next slide, next slide, please. So what I was interested in, in some degree, thinking about water and geography and infrastructure um, is this idea is how does water reflect light, right? But how do we imagine um, water in the evenings when the sun and the moon and the earth and the planets are in relationship to each other? How does that movement then reflect on our bodies, that space between the galaxy and our own lived experiences on the everyday, and how does how does water moderate that um, 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 these kinds of relationships? Next slide, please. So it was really important to me in the exhibition that as the viewers move through the space, both the objects on the walls, the objects in the round, they had a condition of a horizon line. Things were constantly changing, but the viewer were act the viewer would activate the space. Uh, when I was going through the archive and reading um, about Samuel, um, and I was thinking about reading through his ob obituaries, and one of the unnamed artists uh, identified him as his skin as dusky. And I allowed myself to use that word to think about nautical dusk as a way to move through the histories um, that are unknown to me and uh, from the archives unknown to Samuel. Next slide, please. Um, so I wanted at the same time in the exhibition to create different um, horizon lines, but also different conditions of elevation, thinking about the way architecture and geography and infrastructure and water, depending on where one is, the reality of its elevation is really particular in the ways in which we move through uh, different spaces, right? So when we think about what is above, when we think about what is below, and what is what do we think about? is on our um, sort of shoulder line. How do we move our bodies uh, through these different height levels? And how do we, next slide please, sorry. I think that's it. How do we move these bodies through this, these different um, horizon levels and think about the ways in which we compose our bodies through space? And um, these kind of contested geographies and spaces and moving the body at different levels is really what I, uh, think about when I look at and think about Dawood's work. So um, I, I start the conversation with an offering to acknowledge how the body moves uh, through space. Okay, thank you uh, for the question. Um, uh, I'm, I'm really pleased to be able to have this uh, conversation uh in this kind of uh public way which is an extension of uh conversations uh that we had uh over a number of years because i i do uh really believe that in addition to uh their own research and the rigor of their individual uh, practices, 
artist works are shaped and informed by the conversations that they have with each other and the quality uh, of those conversations that they have with each other that are able to uh, provoke and allow for the circumstances of continuing uh, one's work. And that has certainly been <clears throat> true of the conversations that I've had with Turquoise. And uh, I think particularly uh, for me as an artist whose work uh, is largely photo-based, uh, but who doesn't think about photographs as pictures of things as much as I think about them as photographic objects that come out of a particular set of conceptual and material ideas. Uh, I find that my uh, conversations uh, with artists who are working outside of the medium of uh, photography to be uh, particularly uh, valuable. Now, I, I came up as a young artist spending time in the studios of uh, a number of uh, painters and sculptors artists like Mel Edwards and Ed Clark, William T. Williams and Jack Whitten. And, you know, from them, I got, among other things, the notion of the rigor involved in the making of the made object and that the work is indeed an object that embodies a particular set of ideas that are realized through a particular set of formal conceptual and material uh, devices and decisions. So what I want what I want to share with you uh, briefly this evening uh, before we go into our conversation uh, with Elizabeth is uh, two of my most recent uh, projects, the Birmingham Project and Night Coming Tenderly Black. Uh, the Birmingham Project from 2012 was provoked by my experience at the age of uh, 11 of seeing a photograph of uh, one of the surviving sisters uh, of the dynamiting of the 16th Street Baptist Church in which uh, four girls were killed in that dynamiting, and then two black boys were killed in the ensuing uh, violence uh, surrounding that incident that same day. And I wanted to make uh, some work about that. And I didn't want to make uh, didactic work. I didn't want to go to Birmingham and photograph the sites uh, of these incidents. I wanted to make work that uh, both uh, engage in a very uh, resonant way uh, that past, that, uh, that horrific past, and to make work in the contemporary moment that created an engagement with that past that allowed us to consider uh, those lives lost uh, in a way that uh, is, in the traditional sense, uh, a kind of difficult proposition for photographs, which, which, which tend to exist very much in the mildness of their making. And what I wanted to do conceptually was to create a kind of liminal space uh, in between the past and the present that would make uh, that particular historical moment uh, resonate. And so uh, ultimately what I ended up doing was using two pieces of Birmingham social history, the communal space of the Black church, as well as, if we go to the next slide, thank you, as well as the institutional and once segregated space 
of the Birmingham Museum of Art, uh, who I worked through in uh, realizing uh, this project and inviting uh, adults who were the ages uh, of those uh, six young people who were killed at that time, who are the ages that they are, the ages they would have been uh, had they not been murdered uh, on that Sunday uh, in 1963, as well as young people who are the ages that uh, those six young people were, to give them a more palpable, tangible, less mythic uh, presence in terms of uh, exactly what was lost on that day. So the, the Birmingham project becomes the first project in which I begin to intentionally deal with this idea of uh, visualizing uh, the black past and present uh, in the photographic object. How to make something that embodies both simultaneously in order to provoke a very deep response from the viewer. If you go to the next slide, thank you. The other piece of this work that was particularly uh, significant in relation to the siting of the work when it was completed, uh, this work, when it was completed, uh, was exhibited at the Birmingham Museum of Art itself, uh, changing that once uh, segregated space into a space that was occupied uh, by the presence um, in other ways, by the literal presence uh, of these African-Americans from Birmingham who had once been uh, excluded from that space. And certainly for the older African-Americans uh, in Birmingham, uh, the idea that their likeness in any form might come to the museum space uh, was highly improbable. Um, that kind of interrogating of the institutional space and that kind of reclaiming of the institutional space is the other piece of this work. Uh, next slide, please. The project, which actually took me about seven or eight years uh, to conceptualize and then to uh, execute uh, was also accompanied uh, by a video, 9, 9, 1563, uh, that also using the idea of the diptych uh, as a way to open up this notion uh, time as a singular entity and to make this kind of uh, extended multiple, multi-level kind of representation of time uh, is, is also a part of uh, this project. And so the, the Birmingham project is the beginning of my thinking about history and uh, also uh, very specifically about the notion uh, of a certain kind of materiality in relation to the narrative. Because the initial decision was actually to make these photographs in black and white, because black and white is actually the material of photography past. So I wanted the photograph uh, to materially uh, embody the past without too much of a materially conspicuous kind of uh, nod to the contemporary moment uh, in which they were actually made. Because when you think about large scale and color, that's kind of like the language of uh, contemporary photographic practice. So 
So I wanted to situate the work inside of the material history of the medium as well, as one of the things that would help to pull you into that kind of liminal space of the past and the present. Uh, next slide. The, the project that followed the Birmingham project, uh, it might come in Tangerly Black, which uh, imagines the path of fugitivity on the Underground Railroad for, by escaped enslaved African Americans uh, through the landscape of uh, Northeastern Ohio. And this work, I really wanted to uh, engage in the relationship uh, of Blackness as both narrative, Blackness as subject, and Blackness as materiality uh, in the photographic object in a way that for me traces directly back and is entirely informed by the work of uh, African-American photographer Roy D. Carava. Now, D. Carava's work for me posed uh, a radical notion of how photographs of Black subjects could be made in a way that kind of collapsed the narrative and the materiality and the subject into one object. And I thought that I wanted to engage in a conversation with de Carava's proposition uh, about this notion of how materiality uh, around the Black subject could be engaged and embodied uh, in the photographic object. To engage in a conversation with de Carava around what I think is a really radical strategy uh, for making a photograph and to bring that forward into this moment. Go to the next slide, please. So the work that I began making uh, reimagined this movement through the landscape of Northeastern Ohio, uh, using the idea of the gaze of the formerly enslaved fugitive African American moving through this landscape and trying to reimagine that landscape as if through their eyes under cover of darkness and how to make something that resonated with all of the weight, all of the the character of those circumstances. Uh, the photographs, as you saw in the previous slide, were not made under cover of darkness. They were made to embody uh, that idea uh, materially. So while in the past, you know, people have asked me, <clears throat> that it seems like uh, the black figure has disappeared from this work. This is the first work that I uh, made as part of the history project, which unlike the Birmingham project is not portrait based. But for me, the black subject has not disappeared. We're just now examining the landscape as if through the eyes of the black subject and trying to look at the mapping of their movements through this terrain as they move ultimately towards Lake Erie. Next slide, please.
So what I was doing as uh, I was driving around in uh, Northeastern Ohio with my assistant was really looking at the landscape, not for what it was, but for what it might have been, trying to reimagine the site as if they were the site through which Fugitives of African Americans are moving and trying to, in a way, you might say, channel that to my own vision and then to later uh, realize these photographs uh, through a very rigorous uh, process of printing to physically and materially embody the idea. Uh, next slide, please. And even if you if you see the vantage point from which the uh, photographs were made were made to advance this narrative of uh, not being fully exposed. And I use uh, there were a few known. Uh, what were called underground railroad stations. Uh, I use some of those as the points of departure for other pieces of the landscape that were a part of that larger narrative in proximity to these locations. Next slide, please. And of course, uh, water. Uh, is very central to the narrative of uh, fugitivity in the Underground Railroad uh, as a means of covering one's track and one's path, one's path through the landscape. And so a number of these photographs uh, that I made deal with bodies of water uh, as part of uh, next slide, please. And next slide, please. And this is the uh, Lake Erie, which was the destination of those fugitive African Americans moving through the landscape. And then 50 miles across uh, Lake Erie was the presumed uh, freedom of Canada. So I'm, I'm going to stop here, but just to underscore that it's, uh, it, it's very difficult to uh, reproduce these photographs. Uh, in this kind of situation. They're very large scale. Uh, they're meant to create a physical space within the photographic object for the viewer to be able to almost immerse themselves in the space of the landscape being described. And they're very dark as if under cover of darkness in which one's eye has to adjust to be able to see the terrain that one uh, is moving through. So this is a reasonable, uh, I guess, approximation uh, of the work, which if you're anywhere near New York and the Whitney, I strongly encourage you uh, to go see them uh, as actual objects, because uh, these are in fact pictures <laughs> these, are, these are not the photographs, these are not the photographic objects. And I always make a distinction uh, between pictures and the photographic objects because most of the way we come to know uh, photographs is in reproduced uh, form. But for me, there's a very distinct difference uh, between uh, pictures and the photographs. I'm, I'm very specific on how I use those two words, 
because to me, uh, a photograph is only a photographic object. Anything else is a picture of that or a picture based on that. Here I am. Um, I just have to thank you both so much for um, sharing your work with us this evening, giving us your personal peek into these projects. Um, I know your work very well. I know the connections between your work and yet my brain was pinging with a thousand different things we could talk about. I really hope that all of you, um, jumping off of both of what what Dawood just said about the nature of his work being objects. Um, I'm sure for some of you who may be familiar with neither of their work or one of their work, um, I, I hope in these presentations, you've some of these incredible connections have started to uh, be drawn out and, and we can do so further. Um, I wanted to start, um, I was thinking about all four of these projects that you both presented and the kind of um, tension on one hand between the deeply archival based practices that you both come out of and that these projects are really rooted in and that how that how you couple that with imagination and and I think Torquaza you said something about kind of imagination as liberation and the way in which um, imagination is so necessary in the face of the archive and its absences. I, I don't wanna, so I'm, I'm wondering if you can both sort of talk um, to how you approach the, these kinds of tensions in your work between the research and what's there and then the, um, the gaps that you intentionally have to fill in. Well, I, you know, there was uh, there was something that uh, another artist friend of mine said uh, when I last saw him here in Chicago, and uh, we also had a conversation in this particular forum, uh, Jason Malone, and the the thing that Jason said that gave me a kind of uh, easy to remember hook on which to hang all of this uh, activity. You know, as we were parting, he said, we don't have to start from scratch just because that's the lie that we have been taught. You know, that you have to make something incessantly new all the time. And Jason said, we don't have to start from scratch. You know, and this notion that uh, as artists who make things, that we can, in, in fact, find our freedom, our liberation through the making of things that are very much rooted in the past, that brings that past into a contemporary conversation in a way that is not didactic at all, but that is complex and yet points back to that path. You know, it, it's a kind of, it, it, it's another way of saying, I guess, that one uh, doesn't have to leave one's past behind in order to be an artist in the contemporary moment. And for me, making work is that much more deeply meaningful, you know, to the extent that I'm able to use my work as a catalyst to bring that Black path into a very, I think, necessary uh, contemporary conversation. Which is the thing that uh, clearly uh, attracts and connects me to her class's work, you know, and I think particularly in her case, because the work is non-representational, it's non-representational work, uh, and there's long been a question about, you know, Black artists and abstraction, uh, which is also one of the things that 
connects me so deeply to uh, Mel Edwards' work, you know, that the word can engage in a very, you know, highly formalist language of abstraction and be quite radical uh, as well. But one does not necessarily uh, negate the other, you know, and that one can have a practice that is, you know, rigorous and forward looking, but also uh, bring our past with us, pieces of our, of our past into a conversation within this arena uh, because within the arena in which our work functions, uh, those are not always the conversation. So we can flip the conversations, we can talk about other things, but using the language of the mediums that we work with. Um, can, can you all hear me? We can hear you. We, I can't see you at the moment. Oh, you can't. But we would love to hear from you. Okay, <laughs> sorry about that. I've had a, been having a couple of te technical difficulties. Um, yeah, to address this question, I think that Dawood and I have uh, had many conversations about ideas of translation and what does it mean to um, think about these historical moments that can be absolutely horrific and not lean on um, ideas of representation as a means to understand those histories. Um, and, and how can ideas of perception, the interstitial you know, um, um, experiences of these kind of histories that happen in these contested geographies um, be seen through a kind of agency that speaks to what's happening now. And I think that when we, when we think about these histories and the, the gaps that the archives or the gaps at the images or the gaps at the reporting or the gaps of the, in the obituaries or the gaps in the libraries, all of these sort of gaps that um, are left to us, uh, what we can do is use our own imaginations and particularly in the history of black radical imaginations to really dive in techniques that say, okay, how do we think about language? How do we think about movement? How do we think about solidarity? And how do we look for things that are unique in the moment that really illustrate a kind of action uh, that comes from a kind of internal intelligence that is about being human? And in that internal intelligence, within, with deal, even dealing with all of these gaps, you know exists a register of perception, you know exists a register of genius in these inner spaces, uh, moments where the evidence um, of these cities uh, um, being kind of moments of triumph, you're alive, <laughs> I'm alive and alive and the evidence um, these kind of moments, I think, are for me to me um, give me a kind of I don't know, give me a kind of inspiration um, to not fill in the gaps, but definitely to imagine other other why, right? Um, these moments of these moments of um, Away in these more deep vision and, and strategy. Um, I think that's where you know the material and the make come in. They either, um, in the sense, at least for me, for definitely uh, apply those. Um, um, just when I'm, I mean, it's a discursive. Oh, I think we're losing you a little one, bit, Turquoise. One, one, thing, one thing I wanted to say real quickly, you know, because when uh, Turquoise mentions uh, representation, of course, photographs are inherently representational. You know, they visualize, you know, they suck in information through the lens onto the film or onto the files or whatever. So photographs are inherently uh, representational. And so for me, 
you know, the challenge is, you know, how can I push past the inherently representational uh, shape of the medium uh, that I work with to take people to a place, you know, that is not just a description of. And of course, the reason the work has the credibility that it has is because it is representational. So that's, so that's the kind of paradoxical uh, space that I work in. You know, when I think about that paradox of uh, representation, I also think about uh, Perquasi's work within the conversation uh, around uh, abstraction, you know, because there's also the presumed limitation of abstraction, you know, to speak to the kind of issues and circumstance that she makes work about. You know, there is for some people still, I think, a, a lingering Greenbergian notion of what abstraction is, you know, and how you, how you push through that to something uh, more, I guess, uh, provocative and of the moment. But it's, I think it's also, and we talk about this, it's also, it's also about a deep interiority. And I know that I use that word very often. So when I mean um, indeterminacy and interiority and how photograph picks up information, um, I think oftentimes with your work that we, when we talk about the body is inherently there, um, not just in terms of, you know, see through, but also understand, I think when we're, when you're taking these photographs on site and you're connecting with these geographies um, in that moment, your corporeal experience, can be represented, right? So what happens is I think with the objects and the images that come into um, the gallery spaces, we see them behind, right? You making this with your body, your instinct, your nowness, your thereness. And I think that in that um, left behind space or that otherwise space um, of the viewer not seeing or not being there with you, in these geographies, that there's um, sort of evidence of um, that historicity that is indeterminable, even though uh, that there's information in the in the photograph and that space between you making the photographic object in and and um, those histories. I really I really relish in that indeterminacy, you know, even though that there's a, the, the photograph holds a lot of information. And I really relish in that otherwise space. Um, so. I'm so glad you, you brought up this, this sense of in-between space and indeterminacy, Turquoise, because so many things you both have said, I keep circling around. I mean, you, you were talking about horizon lines and twilight and that kind of a liminality. Um, but then I was also thinking, Dawood, as you were talking, I, I don't think I had ever quite thought about these liminalities in your work or spaces between, but um, that kind of break in the diptychs in the Birmingham project and, and the abstraction of that space between. And also in Night Coming Tenderly Black, um, both the liminality of a kind of twilight darkness space as Tokwaze was talking about in her own work, but also the very strange atmosphere that you create by taking these photographs in the day. And so you're looking at night, but you're seeing shadows from the day. And even if you don't, are not aware of that, your body kind of registers this otherness, this otherworldliness, this in-betweenness. And so as we sort of get towards the end of our time here, I'm wondering if maybe we can um, just continue this thought on, on liminality and space between. 
I, I think certainly the the circumstances under which the night coming tenderly black photograph uh, literally embody that liminality because although they're made during the day when I was looking at those landscapes that not that was not what I was seeing or thinking. Uh, in all of the work that I make, I always look at it as a finished thing. I'm visualizing the finished photograph that I'm going to be making. I'm not uh, that preoccupied with the literal description as much as I'm deeply engaged with how that can and will be transformed into uh, a certain kind of photograph. And I think to the more knowing eye, there is certainly a lot more information in those landscapes than there would conventionally be had they been made under at, at, at nighttime or at twilight. Uh, and yet the overall effect is one of that. So you're you're kind of caught in this you know, not only the narrative space of liminality, but the material one too, because there's some real uh, material contradictions going on in those photographs in terms of what you're seeing and what you would see and what I want you to imagine yourself as seeing and what I want you to imagine you're seeing under a very particular set of circumstances through the eyes you know, the surrogate eyes of someone moving through that space in a sense, uh, with a sense of life and death, precarity and desperation and intention. And because the experience is wrapped in that narrative, it does transform, in fact, what you see and how you uh, respond. I also think in the photographs that would, what's so interesting about <clears throat> the ways in which you make the photographs and what we see, I would argue is um, a form of visual architecture in that you create the darkness within the photograph to be experienced as objects. So in my mind, the darkness um, in the photographs become an enclosure, right? So if we think about darkness, nighttime as an enclosure space um, for a condition of fugitivity to make the photographs uh, within these landscapes and then to um, superimpose and create a condition of darkness that was not there um, originally when you're making these photographs, but you include, um, and, I, and I don't think I've actually said this to you, but I'm thinking about that enclosure or darkness as an architecture within the photographs, right? And thinking about the way someone like someone like us, Idea Hartman talks about like what uh, liberations can happen within the enclosure. If we think about the ship as an enclosure, if we think about the kitchen as an enclosure, how do Black people create these liberatory practices of enclosure? The darkness of the photograph, the physicality of it, you know, is another form of enclosure, especially because it's created by you. It's not something that was um, there when you're making the images. So to create um, um, that space, I think it's a uh, geographic and an architectural move, you know, within the within the object. Yeah, and I I I, I would definitely agree. Uh, and the sense of that visually uh, has to do with uh, physical proximity. Right. It kind of immerse, it, 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 it kind of immerses you in the space and gives and encounters. You kind of, yeah. It gives you mm -hmm. three dimensionality, you're in it. Right. You're not just looking at it, you're literally in it. You mm -hmm. know, so I would um I, I I I would definitely agree with that. You know, uh, that and, and the scale also allows the work to in a way wrap itself around you. You know, it's flat, it sits on the wall 
but uh, I've, I've had at least one experience where uh, I, I encountered someone looking at the photograph who, when they saw me, they were so shocked to see me. I felt like I almost had to reach into the picture and pull them out. It felt like they were in it. They felt like they were in it. So there's that kind of uh, enclosure too. But the, the construct, uh, the way the space is constructed uh, in the photograph and the proximity and the vantage point, I think all contribute uh, to uh, what you just described and the geographical, geographical uh, architecture. Uh, yeah. And, yeah. And I just wanted to jump in for a second because um, you, you both do this in your practice. You, you both invite and implicate the viewer in the viewing experience. And I think that would, it's, you know, Torquazi, you spoke so wonderfully, I think for our audiences who haven't seen your work in person about the ways in which you kind of require the viewer's body uh, mm. as kind of part of the, the viewing experience. And Dawood, I think that's something we've talked often about with Night Coming Tenderly Black, but I think it's true in all of the work. And I see how viewers respond to, you know, the Birmingham Project, street portraits, when their bodies are in space with these other bodies at a certain scale mm -hmm. with these other bodies. And I, I think of it for both of you as both this, um, there's a generosity to that invitation, but there's also mm -hmm. a requirement. You're really asking the viewer to do some work um, in your practices. And, and maybe if you're interested in responding to that, maybe that can be, um, kind of where we we trail off this evening. Well, I, I well I'm interested in the go ahead. Go ahead. I'm I'm interested. I want to say one more thing about um the uh, nightcomer tenderly dark um photographs in that I'm interested in um experiencing the encounters um, of the information that's in the photograph, right? So there's a foreground, middle ground, background, and some of them have a situation where visually the spaces are bl blurred and the spatiality you're talking about light um, is sort of this, you know, the, the scattering of um, particles, right? So there's these kind of quantum conditions that happen, I think, when you're watching, walking around the installation in particular, meaning that <clears throat> there's a gallery, there's a photographic object on the wall, there's a gallery and there's a gallery wall, especially, especially at the Whitney, in the way in which the room is treated, right? So you're, you're, you're walking in this kind of um, condition where it's about the encounters of these kind of dynamic spaces, right? So if the viewer comes in, and, um, and I'm interested in seeing Dawood's work in these different contexts, but I'm always confronted um, with uh, the, the idea of the encounter, the encounter of the fence, the encounter of the house, the encounter of the geography, the encounter of the water. And both of, and all of these encounters have a real distinct perception, of course. Um, um, we have a real distinct uh, perception of the encounters, but there's all this spatial that, the space between the encounters, that's also indeterminable, right? So um, I just wanted to say that while we were thinking about precarity and encounters and movement and geography and otherwise and what's outside of uh, both the objects. So yeah, I think that with the work, I'm always walking, continuously walking and looking at the photographs on the wall as a collection of geographies, a collection of uh, sort of enclosures that Dawood has created architecturally, but also a collection of precarious encounters that very much have to do with the ways in which environmental politics are happening now. So. I just wanted to add. Um, Yeah, I'll just jump in real quick while she's frozen, you know, and, and, and respond, uh, Elizabeth, because even the portraits that I've made, uh, the street portrait, uh, I've always been acutely aware of the space that the subject inhabits. Most of the street portraits 
for all of their appearance of informality, uh, very constructed, the spatial geometry, the narrative of the space. Uh, I, I would simply say to explain the street portrait and the, and the deliberate decision to make the photograph of the person in that particular place, that no one in any of those photographs is standing where they are standing in those photographs before I place them there, all of them. So there's a very deliberate uh, paying of attention to the space and then the placing of the subject, you know, the black subject within that space. So the space has always been uh, a very uh, important uh, part of my work, a very intentional and very deliberate uh, part of my work. Because they're made in the street, they have a quality of informality, but they're not. They're, they're very deliberate. And the challenge, of course, is to not have my hand and that degree of deliberateness apparent in the photograph. And I guess that's the thing that I became good at. Um, I think we could continue this all night and we might have to, uh, <laughs> We might have to on another occasion, but um, on that note, uh, and I hope you can't hear everything going on in the background in my house at the moment, but I just want to thank you both um, for your your generosity, your time, your ideas. Um, I'm sure everyone listening tonight is coming away with so much to think about, um, and I hope you all get a chance to see uh, Dawood's show and Torquaze's work. Um, I also have to extend a huge thank you to my colleagues, Megan Hoyer, Andy Hawks, and Yang Zhu for all of their work in putting together this wonderful program tonight. Um, again, thank you, Dawood and Torquaze, and um, I hope you all have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Okay, thank you all. <laughs>